Well, just as Jesse uh, mentioned, I've been involved. I'm primarily a photographer. I taught pho photography and photographic history for over 35 years at the University in California here, where I still live in the same town. Uh, uh, I got involved in Ernest Bloch's photography as an undergraduate at the University of Oregon in Eugene, Oregon, where I where I grew up. And uh, some of you know this already, but long story short, I got involved as a you know, very young fellow, 20 years old, and the family opened their arms, and I began to research, edit, and print from his negatives in the uh, dark room. Uh, made in uh, Lucien Bloch's uh, guest house way back in 1970-71. So, uh, and now and then, every once in a while, I keep doing doing things on Ernest Bloch, and it uh, seems to be popping up a lot lately. Uh, and now for this month, really May and June of 2022, it literally is a kind of a point in time that needs to be marked, I think, and that is the extraordinary meeting between Alfred Stieglitz and Ernest Bloch in uh, probably May or June of 1922, where Bloch sees Stieglitz's uh, photographs of clouds and proclaims them to be music. And, and that goes on, we'll go on from there and we'll go deeply into it. Uh, you can see them here, the two pictures, uh, Bloch self-portrait 1922, this is in Peterborough uh, in the summer, and uh, Stieglitz 1922 as well. So they're 16 years apart. Stieglitz is older, uh, obviously, and uh, but uh, you can see from there the con the the eye the eyes staring directly at you. They were both very intense personalities, and I think that comes through in both pictures. Uh, just a quick overview on the bottom of the slide. Uh, obviously, for most of you, your your understanding of Alfred Stieglitz is probably limited. You're musicians largely, so I'll go pretty in, much into Stieglitz and O'Keefe, painting, photography, music, and something called synesthesia. Uh, then move into Ernest Bloch before he comes to, uh, to America, before 1916, talking about synesthesia and something called eurythmics, which many of you are familiar with. And, and then finally, they, bring, they come together in America, Ernest Bloch, Stieglitz, New York, that five or six year period uh, and then specifically 1922 when Bloch sees those photographs. And then I'll complete it with uh, uh, a, uh, a brief encounter with Bloch's own photography where he more overtly becomes, uh, if you will, an artistic explorer with a camera. Uh, but specifically the moment in time, the hundred years is this, and that is the uh, experience that Stieglitz himself recounts a year later. These are his words. Uh, and you can read them yourself here, but I'll just hit a few high points. He talks about he began to work with clouds and he was greatly excited daily for weeks. He, he was wrought up, always believed he had nearly gotten what he wanted. This is his words, a most tantalizing sequence of days. I knew exactly what I was after. I had told Miss O'Keefe, who he was living with at this point, I wanted a series of photographs which, when seen by Ernest Bloch, the great composer, he would exclaim, music, music, man, why that is music. How did you ever do that? And he would point to violins and flutes and oboes and brass, full of enthusiasm, and would say he'd have to write a symphony called Clouds, not like Debussy's, but much, much more. And when finally I had my series of 10 photographs printed, Bloch saw them. What I said I wanted to happen happened verbatim. Now this is Stieglitz's account from a year after this. So it's, it's really a bringing, bringing together of photography and music in a way that, uh, in a photographer and a composer, that it, it really has, it never happened before. And it's a point in time that really uh, articulates the significance, I think, of, of why we're celebrating this 100 years later. Okay, just as a reminder, uh, those of you familiar with the Ernest Bloch's photographs, you know most of them are, intimate family pictures, pictures of uh, uh, people he would bump into in his hikes in Switzerland, the mountains, uh, and, uh, and, and colleagues and musicians. So it's kind of a diary, basically, of, of his life in his photography. Uh, but as I say here, he was an enthusiastic photographer. He made over 6,000 images over 40 years. He was in, uh, his work was diaristic, as I say, put in albums to show friends. 
But after meeting and seeing the, the, the photographs of Stieglitz, his attitude towards photography changed. And then Stieglitz proved to him that photography could be an art expressing feeling and the soul. Bloch began to explore what he could do with a more overt expression in the early 30s. You can see, you know, just the difference between the self-portrait with his family on the left and a picture many years later uh, that he took in, uh, in southern Switzerland, uh, kind of with his, the concept that this might be evocative, somewhat similar to, uh, to Debussy, titled it Debussy, in fact. So a transition, and we'll, that, that Stieglitz is in the middle of that transition for Bloch. Okay, now let's go into Stieglitz. Stieglitz, most of you are not familiar with Alfred Stieglitz probably very much. You can see he was 16 years older than Ernest Bloch. Uh, uh, he was born in New Jersey to parents of German Jewish descent. Actually, they were quite successful in wool, uh, the sale of wool uh, and the marketing of wool. He studied mechanical engineering in Germany, so they sent him to Germany almost, almost a decade, nine years. Part of his studies involved early experiments with photographic processes. He first began to experiment with photography in these years. He studied the piano as well as an amateur, but he was very enthusiastic about learning the piano. But while in Berlin, now he's Berlin, he was in Berlin year, for years, hanging out in cafes uh, and being a young 20 year old in Berlin must have been something. While in Berlin, he went to many performances of Wagner's operas. He writes, uh, this is Stieglitz writes, he heard Der, Der Meister singers dozens of times. In fact, some argument that he may have seen it a hundred times, which is hard to believe, but we'll leave that as it is. And the four hour flow of that magical work, as he said, was to him the ultimate in creative art. Uh, so he was really deeply enmeshed as a, as a, appreciate, as a listener and appreciator of Wagner. Uh, and of course he tried as an amateur pianist to, to uh, he played his own. And it's, on a bigger picture, Stieglitz was influenced by Wagner's notion of, pardon my German, what is it, Gesundheitswerk? Okay, that's the best I'll do. The concept of the total work of art that united poetic drama, music, visual arts, and dance. This unification of the arts. And it was seen as a way to counterbalance the growing fragmentation of modern society. So there is a whole theory there that, that I won't have uh, time to go into, but uh, there is a, co a bringing together of the art forms that Stieglitz was very enthusiastic about. So this is way back in the, uh, in the 1880s. Stieglitz himself, of course, begins to explore photography successfully. Uh, and he, as he comes back to New York, he, he, although he had a difficult transition back to America, he just loved those German cafes. But he, he played this, ended up being played a seminal role in the development of art photography and the dissemination of modern art generally in the United States. Not only did his photography revolution revolutionize the medium, but his intellectual and cultural leadership through exhibitions and publications was largely responsible for the success of artists such as O'Keeffe, Marston Hartley, Paul Strand. Promotion of fine art photography was vital for the international acceptance of the medium's aesthetic value. So what do we see here? One of his more well-known photographs, actually, 1909, the steerage on board ship, actually going from America back to Europe uh, for a visit. Uh, at first, it doesn't seem like much to our eyes here in 2022, but let's take a look at it in a couple of ways. Uh, first of all, there is the story, you know, the steerage being the lower class below that, that sleep on the deck with family, with families and children. And the upper, you know, with the, with the fancy hat at the time, the popular hat, the man with the hat on the center uh, above. So there's this kind of uh, strata of social, of social uh, society laid out right in the photograph. So is that level. The other level that actually w that drew him to take the picture, in addition to that, was the geometry. You know, the little dot, the white dot of the hat located center top there. And then the, the angular, um, uh, the angular aspects uh, and the kind of geometric aspects of the picture with the, with, the, uh, with the walk plank there and the tilt and this and tilt and that. So there's a kind of geometry that actually drew him to the picture. He talks about it and then the story. So it, it really functions on, on two levels all at once. And, it's, and it really, when you think about it in that way and you see it in that way, it's really quite 
you can see why it's a, a kind of mark in time for Stieglitz's photography. It shows what he could do with a camera. Back to New York, uh, city of ambition. He's taking pictures about the world around him and about the changes. He titles it Old and New New York, uh, City of Ambition, bo both in 1910. So he's, if you will, documenting, recording uh, uh, the, the changes around him, but he's also, you can see by the titles, seeing the meaning. Uh, even equally important to that is what he did with exhibitions. He was the first place, his gallery was the first place where modern European art was exhibited in America. Here, a picture that Stieglitz took of the Picasso and Brock exhibit. It also included African sculpture. So this bringing together a quote unquote primitive art with modern art, the geometry, the simplicity, they were, this was really quite a revolutionary idea here in New York to bring this work over. Uh, the, and, and I say, as I say at the bottom, it's, this is really a visionary protagonist in the birth of American modern art because he influences and, and, and encourages other American artists. You can see Arthur Dove, an American painter, exploring even a few years earlier, pure abstraction, you know, he, nature symbolized. Uh, so there is this, there is this uh, Stieglitz pushing forward American modern art, partly by being inspired by, by uh, European art. And most importantly is uh, George O'Keefe in this equation. Uh, and here she is, 1917. Here's the first exhibition. He, did, he placed the uh, 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 O'Keeffe's paintings on the wall of the gallery, uh, drawings and paintings. And he's, he's famous for having quoted, uh, as, having said this, he's quoted as saying, upon seeing O'Keeffe's work for, for the first time, he says, finally, a woman on paper. So that's his first response to O'Keeffe's drawings and paintings. Uh, and there's, there's an abstract energy uh, in her work right away. Here are two pieces. This is where we start to see painting and photography, this kind of, pardon me, painting and music, uh, painting and music start to uh, come together. You can see this is O'Keeffe, 1918, shortly after he, she first exhibited with uh, Stieglitz. Music, pink and blue, number two, blue and green music. I mean, it. It might be a bit of a stretch for us, but if you can just go along with O'Keeffe here for a second, maybe more obvious on the right, blue and green music, you can see the broad strokes, the intense kind of uh, almost pattern, well, water pattern on the low, lower left, that black and white energy on the top center right, uh, combined with the geometry. There, there's an attempt to create con uh, motion and conflict as well as uh, interactions of forms that might mimic, in her mind, mimicking music. And the same is true on the left. As I say below, along with other American artists, American avant-garde, Stieglitz and George O'Keefe were in the belief, the belief that music in its fusion of intuitive expression, content, and abstract rational form was the most, per most perfect of the arts. So they're aspiring to, if not exactly imitate, but correlate with, uh, with music. Oops, sorry, it went a little too fast. Most of you will, if you know O'Keeffe's paintings, will recognize the Black Iris from a few years later in 1926, where this remarkable close-up of a, of a flower, and here she is in 1922, uh, photographed by Stieglitz. Okay, that's a brief introduction to O'Keeffe and Stieglitz. So we'll go on to Ernest Bloch and synesthesia in, in Eurythmics. So let's just talk about synesthesia itself for a second. Synesthesia is the perception in one sense from the experience of another. There's other ways of describing it, but that's the idea is to see, uh, hear music and see color, for example. Well, that's exactly what Vasily Kandinsky did. In early January 1911, Russian painter Kandinsky was in Munich and went to a Schoenberg concert with his friends. What he heard showed him the parallels between Schoenberg's music, which was starting its trip towards serial music, serial music and atonality, and his own painting, which was trying to break from the traditional figurative style of painting. Okay, Stieglitz, and pardon me here, I have Kandinsky said that he could sense sound as color. He could, he saw, he heard the music and he saw color. That's what he says he could do, and he wrote extensively about the correspondence of music and painting. His paintings are considered 
the first abstract works of art, not descriptive of anything in the world, but purely about the interaction of color and form inspired by sound. And here's an example. This is after, this is Schoenberg, okay? I don't know if you can go down this line with me or not, but uh, uh, it's chaotic, would you agree? No, it's, it's a little bit hard to get a hold of in terms of visually, but you can see if you think of it, I don't want to spend a lot of time analyzing it, but the color, the energy, the marks, the small interactive marks, there's cross hatching and all sorts of things on the left, broad strokes on the right, un things moving left, moving right, up and down, uh, upper left corner is different than the lower right corner, if you think of it. Uh, if you look at it in parts and pieces, you can kind of see what, uh, what he was trying to do. He even wrote, color is the keyboard. The eyes are the harmonies, the soul is the piano with many strings, the artist is the hand that plays, touching one key or another to cause vibrations of the soul. So Kandinsky, he's not alone in this, but he really is the first to probably articulate extensively the uh, interaction between music and color itself and then put it into a form in painting. So he was what a stud, people that study synesthesia would call a synesthete. In other words, somebody that literally saw color when he heard music. Now, no record exists indicating Bloch knew of the work of Kandinsky. However, a fascination existed among artists and musicians of the pre-World War I era in Europe with synesthesia and hypnosis and the new theories of Freud and Jung regarding the unconscious and the relationship to music and artistic creation. I mean, this was in the air. This is in Paris, Geneva, Berlin, and specifically a hypnotist named Emil Magnin. I don't know if that's prob proper pronunciation. I apologize if it's not. Presented popular dance and music performances by a Madame Magdalene G. Under hypnotic influence, Magdalene, a non-musician, non-dancer, performed extraordinary interpretive dances to music. Magdalene appeared to have been a synesthete, seen by Bloch in Dal Croze's Geneva studio in about 1904. 1904, pardon me. And here's the a, a detail of a self-portrait by Bloch in 1916. And you can see a print of Magdalene is above his left shoulder on his wall. Uh, and here on the right, up the right, sees Magnin hypnotizing Magdalene here on the right. On the right. And then here's another picture of her doing one of her interpretive dances. So Bloch was an, a fan, to use a, a colloquial term, of uh, Magdalene and what she did in that studio, in, in Del Croce's studio. So there's an experience of... of uh, synesthesia in another form. In that same picture again on the, upper, uh, uh, on the upper left of this slide. As most of you know, he as Bloch studied with Del Croze in Geneva starting at the age of 14 at the Geneva Conservatory and with, became friends for many years. Uh, and, and as many of you musicians know, Del Croze developed the Eurythmics, a holistic method of music education focusing on expression and correspondence of both musical and physical rhythms. Del Croze also was friends with a Swiss painter, Ferdinand Hodler, who incorporated Del Croze's theories into his painting. And you can see Song in the Distance from Ferdin by Ferdinand Hodler from 1905 on the top of right. And if you look on the far left of this screen above on the wall, it's a little blurry, but you can see a print of that very picture on Bloch's wall. So he was a very, he was he very, very much enjoyed Hodler's painting as well. And so there's another correspondence in this case, you know, in this, uh, uh, in this case, uh, Eurythmics, uh, combining senses, combining experiences. By the way, that's a picture by, of Del Crow's by Block at around 1900. So very briefly, so photography and Block, mo most of you see the saw the previous uh, presentation. He was a, an avid amateur photographer. He was very meticulous, very careful, but it was, you know, personal pictures of his family on the left, pictures of his family all over this whole slide. You know, all of them date around 1912. Uh, travel, uh, hiking with his son 
who's uh, the second from the left on the bottom, Ivan, and then he himself is in the top center, self-portrait with the farm family, he loved the people that are close to the land, and what a wonderful picture from 1909, a very precise kind of document diary picture. And of course, most of you have seen this, the mushroom lady from 1912, who came to sell mushrooms to the, their home in Saint-Denis. Uh, direct, simple, descriptive, a diary in a sense, but of an amazing uh, a woman who happened to show up with mushrooms. But that's his, so his photography is very much a part of his life as a, as a kind of avid hobby, and, but a diary. Finally, to New York. Block comes to New York. When he arrives in America, he had used the camera extensively, as I already mentioned, and he had shared his photographs and albums. However, the thought of the camera as a tool for significant art expressing the soul as he associated with his music would have been foreign. That would have been a foreign idea, although it seems odd now. If for him at that point, it would have been a foreign idea. In fact, uh, as we move into his meetings with Stieglitz, we start with Waldo Frank, and this is Bloch, uh, sorry, Lucienne herself writes in a letter to his mother. Uh, he mentions meeting Waldo Frank at the date I am reading. This is Lucienne writing. He has not met Stieglitz. I am sure he was introduced by Waldo Frank whom Bloch met via Roman, Roman Roland, as many of you know his name. Roland was in touch with people all over and gave Bloch a list of them in New York City when Bloch came there in 1916. There's a portrait of Frank by Stieglitz. Now, Fall of Frank commissioned Bloch, this is within months, I mean, this is now less than a year after arriving in America, this is early 1917. Bloch commissioned Bloch to write an article for the Seven Arts, a magazine that uh, Waldo Frank was a co-editor of. And, and this is a very interesting kind of slice of Bloch's thinking from 1917, I think. And he wrote, and he, serious composers persist in the obsession with technique and procedure. They discuss and argue. They laboriously create their arbitrary brain begotten works. While the emotional element, the soul of art is lost in the passion for mechanical perfection. Art is the outlet of the mystical emotional needs of the human spirit. It is created rather by instinct than by intelligence, rather than by intuition, than by will. Doesn't that sound like Ernest Bloch, though? Uh, and I won't read the all before, but down below, but basically he, he associates the uh, technical, arbitrary aspect of brain begotten with uh, mechanical inventions. Uh, he doesn't say the camera, but phonograph, piano, cinema, cinematograph, so he actually distinguishes that uh, you know, these mechanical devices aren't, aren't uh, tools for art right here in his own writing. This is 1917. So that kind of sets the stage uh, for, as I say here, you know, he's, just, he's skeptical of the machine. And then, of course, there's a change. Here he is with the camera. That's probably similar to the camera he had down below. Well, it comes with this. These are... Stieglitz would hold Saturday evening dinners at the Far East Tea Garden in, on, at Columbus Circle, who many of you are familiar with, in New York, uh, and with groups of 20 or more artists and literary friends and discussions following dinner on art, psychology, and culture. Bloch was introduced to this group in late 1916 by Waldo Frank. It could have been early 1917, but it's right in that period. S essentially, straight from Europe, uh, what is that, 30, he's 36 years old. He, he was invited to these dinners, maybe more than one, by uh, Waldo Frank. Who was there? Well, O'Keefe, uh, Paul Rosenfeld, a music critic for the New York Times. Many of you may know that name. He was he he wrote about Bloch's music and was very uh, uh, very uh, positive. Waldo Frank, who you've met, Arthur Dove, the painter, who actually ended up being an instructor of O'Keefe, a uh, Bloch. Sherwood Anderson, a writer, an important American writer, John Maron, a, 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 a painter, many other people. So you can imagine what that must have been like uh, in the Saturday evening dinners. So that is where it all started, 1916, late 16, like 1917. And Bloch actually described what happened at one of the dinners, probably the first, in a, in a, in a, uh, in a dinner conversation he had way much later in 1950. And when he was teaching a six week summer course, here's Albert Elk, Elkus, who was chair of the UC Berkeley music department. 
As you know, by this time, uh, Block was teaching summer uh, courses at Berkeley. Uh, he had hosted a dinner for Block probably in the summer of 1950. At the dinner table, Albert's son, Jonathan, 18 at the time, recounts Block telling this story. Okay, this is Block telling the story of the dinner at the, the, one of those dinners at uh, the, the, the Far East Garden restaurant in New York. At a dinner in New York, Block was giving his host, Alfred Stieglitz, every reason why photography could not be considered art. This has got to be their first meeting in, in, uh, when he first arrives in America. Why photographers, hence, could not be considered artists. Fine, said Stieglitz. Meet me at my gallery early Sunday morning and we'll photograph together. They met and went forth with Graflex camera and tripod. They stopped at a lower midtown. This is a story that Block tells now. A uh, midtown corner whose building is the sky. They were both thought promising. Stieglitz set up his camera, focused it, took a picture. He changed place and without repositioning the camera, told Block it was his turn. Stieglitz timed the exposure identically. They returned to the studio and each developed his plate in the same chemicals and with the exact same timing. Block saw at once that his cityscape was drab and lifeless capturing none of the luster he saw in Stieglitz. But how can this be? Block asked. Stieglitz said, it is because you do not love it. You do not believe in it. Now, this is the, a story that Block told at a dinner at Elkis's home in 1950. Well, how true this is, we will never know, but it's a heck of a story. Uh, it might, probably has some kernel of truth, but just imagine what that first meeting would have been like. I mean, we got Block, 36 years old, had given 100 lectures at the Geneva Conservatory on, on aesthetics and music, and he had a highly developed philosophical position that art must spring from the soul and the intuition, not the intellect, as we've learned. But he, in the tradition of the symbolist artists and musicians, equated the machine and the camera with objective description and the intellect. He was strong-willed, articulate, and sure of himself, as mo most of you Block scholars know very well. Both O'Keefe and Stiglitz, also in the symbolist tr tradition, felt strongly that music was the purest form of artistic expression, as we've learned earlier. So if Block the musician stated he described you, as he describes in that uh, description I just went through, that photography could not be an art and photographers could not be artists during one of these crowded Sunday dinners, Stiglitz had the ultimate ch challenge. The story Block told in his lectures might be true. He may have elaborated. I think he probably did elaborate, as he was tended to do, but it's really uh, a, a, a very key point in time for us. Well, here we are many years later. Block, uh, Stiglitz passes away in 1946. Uh, Block writes a tribute in the memorial portfolio, which you can see the cover of on the right. This is Block talking now about many years later. I, I shall never get, forget my two short meetings with him so many years ago. They are alive as he is within me. Since 20 years, I have in my courses almost each year referred to him and quoted a few unforgettable talks we had. How I wish we had that on tape. Uh, not only his marvelous works of art, his interpretations of life, what he called the machine. The machine is subservient to man's thoughts and visions. His incredible technique he remember, never mentioned. It was a tool in his hands for a higher purpose. What an example of spirit in our present time of robots. So this is written in 1947. Uh, so you can see Stieglitz completely convinced uh, Bloch uh, of uh, the uh, validity of photography as an art form. Well, let's get to the nub of the matter here. Uh, in January of 1922, Stieglitz suggested the December issue of a publication called Manuscripts be dedicated to the question of can a photograph of the significance of art. He invited many people to respond, including Marcel Duchamp, Carl Sandberg, of course, George O'Keefe, Waldo Frank, and the composer Ernest Bloch. You can see some of the names uh, listed here on the cover of that magazine. I'm going to have to go a little quicker here. Waldo Frank submitted very early in 1922. And basically uh, says the following. This is Stieglitz writing about it a year later. He says, Frank thought it was hypnotism that I had over my sitters that, that uh, was the reason they were so powerful. Uh, and then his, 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 his uh, brother-in-law asked him why he gave up the piano for such a musical person. Uh, 
and and so in response to that, so he made up his mind. I'd answer my Mr. Frank and my brother and I, uh, brother and I. I'd finally do something I had in mind for years. I'd make a series of cloud pictures. He says yeah, I wanted to photograph clouds to see my to put down my philosophy of life really, uh, and he says no special tax on them as yet free. And here's one of his pictures. You'll see in a minute more of this. Uh, so, and this goes back to the quote I started the talk with. So he began to work with clouds and with great excitement daily for weeks. I knew exactly what I was after, told Miss O'Keefe. He wanted to, the photographs, which when seen by Block would say, he sees music, oboes, brass, full of enthusiasm, would say he'd have to write a symphony called Clouds, not my, like Debussy's, but much more. And then it happened, verbatim. Block did not write a symphony called Clouds, as you all of you know, but in 1922, the year he saw Siegel's The Cloud Photographs, he did write evocative piano places, including Poems of the Sea and Five Sketches in Sepia, and several other pieces I don't have time to go into. But uh, so there, uh, he, he didn't quite do what he said he'd do, but he was, I think, in the spirit. Well, let's look at them. Music, a sequence of 10 cloud for photographs by Stieglitz, 1922. This is what he showed uh, Ernest Bach. And this is a sequence of 10 pictures of clouds, starting with this one, the dark, moody thing on the dark. You can imagine how the Bloch's enthusiasm going through these. Number two on the left, number three on the right. You know, always keeps a little piece of landscape in it. To our eyes now, it doesn't seem like much, but uh, kind of trying to put yourself in the position of Ernest Bloch, a composer, seeing the lights and darks and this sort of thing, the changes. Uh, four and five, now in contrast, it's interesting to go from there uh, to there. You can just see the, 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 the mood, the darkness, the kind of transition that's going on. Oops. Uh, Number six, number seven, you can see from dark to light, sun peeking through. Uh, number eight, number nine, from light to dark. Oh boy, what a deep, piece, some deep sound showing up on number nine. And, uh, and then finally number 10, where it kind of is released, there's a kind of relief from it. Uh, so you can see, he, Stieglitz also called this series uh, f uh, Clouds in 10 Movements. This the one. This title was was he used more more frequently the music sequence of ten cloud photographs. So this that's the series that that's that Ernest Bloch saw in 1922, 100 years ago, uh, this month, possibly next month. Uh, so and so enthusiastically responded to it. And this is a letter from July 1st. That's why we know the date so accurately is because July 1st probably was June. So it's coming up on the hundredth anniversary in the New York gallery is where Stieglitz uh, showed Block the pictures. Here's Stieglitz's letter. Uh, I'll just read the first little bit of it. Have you any idea how much it meant to me to have you feel about those photographs as you did, to have you see in them what you do, and to know that what you express I understand and feel is true. It was a memorable hour, a very rare one. And he goes on to that there is much, very much that you are suffering physical and otherwise that has been my lot too. So they, you can clearly see they both had their, uh, their physical complaints and mental complaints. You can imagine they shared that as well. But so that's a key moment for really, you know, in, in my opinion, the history of Stieglitz and the history of photography itself, where you merge, you get a composer to respond to photographs in this way. Later on in the years, I won't go beyond this simply, he transitioned from, uh, from uh, something he called Songs of the Sky on the lower right uh, and, and transitioning into what he titled equivalents, which are, this is the term he started to apply to his, his cloud photographs. Here he is taking pictures of clouds on the lower left. Uh, so, so Stieglitz. Now, Lucienne Block, his daughter, also uh, had some memories regarding her, her father's response to Stieglitz's photographs. He, she says, father must have seen Stieglitz at least five times, if not more. I remember Bloch saying that the photos of O'Keeffe's hands by Stieglitz were as erotic as anything father had seen. Also the photo of high-heeled shoes. So that's Lucien 
recounting her father's response to Stieglitz's photographs. Well, now, as, you, as we know already, we, the uh, uh, Waldo Frank's response was part of the impetus to do the cloud photographs for Stieglitz, calling him portraits infected by hypnotism and such. But Block also responded to this article, this the request for a comment on can a photograph have the significance of art in 1922. And his response is really quite remarkable. This is Block writing this time, as most of you know, he was a director of the Cleveland Institute of Music. And this is what he writes. And I will put uh, a few of the key, this isn't everything, but this is, is it will give you the feeling of the enthusiasm. Uh, besides his stupendous technique uh, and a knowledge of every detail of instrumentation and overpowering of the smallest possibility, taming of the chemical forces, transmutation of the imperfections or weaknesses of material into artistic ends, every picture of Stieglitz embodies an idea and makes one think. What a great way of describing Stieglitz's photographs. It exceeds usual photography as far as great artists exceeds a mechanical piano. You can see now that machine being overcome. The dead camera and all other technical means are only tools in his hands. Old and new New York you saw before. He has not only photographed things as they seem to be or as they appear to the bourgeois, he has taken them as they really are in the essence of their real life and he sometimes accomplished the miracle of compelling them to reveal their own identity, not even always as they are, but as they would be if all their potentialities could emerge freely. And this is the greatest art, because all signs of te technique have disappeared for the sake of the idea. And you can almost put up any Stieglitz picture in, in, with this combination, but I chose those two. There are portraits of Stieglitz which condense in them sells a whole Balzac character. Two portraits of two entirely different people here, but you can get the, the flavor of what he's after. There are pictures of hands so beautiful that one could cry before them. This is Bloch talking about Stieglitz's photographs. <coughs> there are pictures of skyscrapers and railway and backyards that move you as if the lives and tragedies of lives connected to them were written clearly on, clearly on their features. The Hand of Man, 1907, you haven't seen that before. City of Ambition. A picture of a young, healthy, and beautiful girl may make you weep because you feel all that she could be, your infinite potentialities, and realize that in our actual society, all these strangers are probably doomed to death and disfiguration. It's probably this picture he's talking about, by a young Georgia Engelhard by Stieglitz in 1920. And this is how he finishes his statement. Stieglitz has created and is still creating a work in a world that is so completely new, original, and powerful that I am distressed. Because, it, because I think of the usual fate of all true creators, our time does not seem to realize the greatness of the man and the profound meaning of his discovery, but the future undoubtedly will, and lukewarmness or lack of understanding have never prevented the greatest artists from creating, from giving, giving, always, in spite of it all. And there he is as the uh, director, composer. You can almost see Bloch's talking about himself as much as Stieglitz, wouldn't you agree? And those of you who saw the previous presentation in November will recognize that picture. Here's Block taking a picture of his own hands in 1923 in the summer in Peterborough. So, you know, he, he, he's trying it on his own here. Okay, as we get to the effect of this, all of this interaction with Stieglitz and the transition to photography recognized as an art form by Block, he tries it out for himself uh, in the early 1930s. Uh, as all of you know, he was commissioned in 1930 to compose the Avedith Hokadish uh, Sacred Service and moved to the Swiss-Italian border for qu the quiet he needed to work on such a grandiose, grandiose project. He describes this passionate and romantic setting of text for the Jewish Saturday morning service as a, quote, cosmic poem, a glorification of the laws of the universe. Here's just, I have in the upper right, just the top fraction of the first page of the, of the, uh, of the uh, composition, Sacred Service. 
And this is the village he composed it in, which is an interesting thing to think about the nature of that music, which you all are familiar with. And he, he was walking around this little, very, very rustic location in southern Switzerland while composing this. Well, he also walked through the landscape and, of course, photographed trees. And he says, after two days of solitary walks in spite of the snow, it is again beginning to fall. This is in a letter. I was able to at last speak to the trees, the rocks, the flowers, and they, re and they replied to my heart. This is from a 1931 letter to Ada Clement back in San Francisco at the conservatory. Yeah, but, but of course, he'd seen this picture as well in 1922 by Stieglitz, Dancing Trees. And you can see him using his camera, moving around on the left, position himself so he has some geometry. You can imagine him walking up a hillside to catch this light on the side of the birch tree, or aspen tree, I think, I'm not sure. Uh, and this is his daughter. Uh, in Rovrader Block began to do, his, do a series of tree photographs, and this is his, his daughter Luciana remembering. It took him a good, good year to finally get to photograph it, photographing them, because when I was there in 1930, he was walking, he would say, you have no idea how extraordinary these trees are when there are a few leaves and when it's dark in the back so they show up. He kept saying, I've got to photograph them. I must make a study of trees. And that's when he would point to them and say, look at this harmony of trunks. This is Lucien recounting to me, actually, uh, back in the day in 1970, 71, uh, what his, his, uh, her memories are of him talking about his pictures. You can see him moving around until he gets the right position uh, of kind of this layering uh, or interaction of form. Well, so the, the composer composing, in this case with a camera. Here are just uh, fragments from his letters regarding his experiences taking pictures above the trees. This is to Leda Clement, uh, in, written in 1931. And I'll just read some. For, this is the right on the top. It says, the other day alone, I discovered, uh, as I discover in every walk now, extraordinary places, a real huge uh, of the finest of fir trees. Very rare here. There were birches and chestnut trees abound. In a big canyon, I stopped, lied on the earth, began taking pictures of one, then the other, amidst an impressive silence. And suddenly it was as if the soul of each tree was uh, warming my heart and actually communing with me. A moment of deep emotion, I cried. I had become myself a tree, a much better thing to be than a man. Uh, so you can see the camera, and it really became kind of an instrument to see more, if you will, or to commune. Uh, and then finally, I have really got the soul, here he is, underlying soul of a few trees, birches, chestnut trees especially, and several people were enthusiastic about them in Paris and were and wonder if I should not expose uh, all that with my Leica. This size, he, I'm not sure exactly what he's saying there, but he wrote, writes a little square on the letter showing how small it is and then an enlarger is used. He had them enlarged up to a, about three by five inches uh, professionally. So that's how he saw them later. And had a few, uh, a few printed as I made more than a thousand negatives since a year. So he was very enthusiastic. Here's a camera similar to what he was using, the Leica. So his enthusiasm for photography as seeking soul, if you will, in this case, the soul of the trees, was very, very significant. And most of you will have seen these. These are where he titles them after composers, Bach, Beethoven on the right. Wow, what a contrast that is. The, you know, the interaction, you can almost see the counterpoint, if you will, on the left and the, the emotional statement on the right. The, if most people don't quite see Mozart on the, on the left, but you know, it's complete light, but sturdy. Leave it at the museum, you can see Debussy, and it's fragmentary, evocative. And, uh, a, a, it's, it says only part of what's there and lets you more or less feel the rest. Uh, so block, transitions from being a skeptic of photography as an art form, an enthusiast, enthusiastic amateur, but a skeptic to an enthusiastic practitioner, if you will, uh, as an amateur, as a hobbyist uh, in the early 1930s. 
Uh, and then later in the 30s, as most of you know, he moves to the French Alps, uh, where he continues to compose a vast number of works. And as you can see, I'm not focusing on his musical compositions here. Most of you are familiar with what's going on with that. But here he photographs some clouds in 1936. Here he is, probably photographed by his daughter uh, on a hike uh, with the, his, his, of course, he was in, intensely interested in mushrooms, as is indicated by the picture on the right. Okay, that's it. But I do have to show this picture. That's me in 1970 in Eugene, Oregon, as an undergraduate. I had just gotten started on the Ernest Block project. And here I am taking pictures of clouds, two of which are on the right that I did with a big 8x10 inch film camera using plates, just like Alfred Stieglitz. So you can see my, see my enthusiasm. Here it is 52 years later. So that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I am, as you can see, it's a lot of fun for me to do this. It's been many years. Great, Thank Eric. Thank you. Thank you so much. If you want to stop sharing your uh, screen, okay, I can uh, do that. There may very well be comments uh, or questions for Eric Johnson on this fascinating presentation. Maybe I can take the liberty of uh, starting out with one. Um, this transition that Bloch makes from a kind of prejudice against photography, or at least a refusal to take it seriously as art, uh, and then being in effect converted mm -hmm. by this experience uh, 100 years ago with uh, Alfred Stieglitz. Um, it does seem as though it really has to do with his attitudes towards technology. He sees it as something which is purely mechanical yes, and therefore uh, doesn't require anything in the way of uh, artistry mm -hmm. or some sort of creative vision. Mm -hmm. And that is precisely what uh, Stieglitz was able to demonstrate was not yes. true. Yes. So that's right. That's it in a nutshell. I mean, you can see he wrote about it, the mechanical inventions. I mean, uh, he, meanwhile, he was, you know, working on, you know, obviously composing using a piano and various other things. So he ends up later uh, describing making parallels between the piano, the piano and a camera. But uh, in the beginning, he didn't see that. Yes, or the only musical instrument he can compare to a camera is uh, a mechanical piano, at least that image. That's right, that's right, that's right. In but that. that was the pianola, right? The, the, I, right. I, yeah, okay. So he sees the camera as almost a kind of photocopy machine. You know, you slap it there. I suppose there so. And he was so, so enthusiastic about it. I mean, he took hundreds and hundreds of pictures, family, friends, everywhere he went. I mean, he took 6,000 pictures, but he just reserved that soul, the seeking of the soul, which was so much, you know, he was, that was his vision uh, for, uh, uh, didn't quite, the camera didn't quite, it, for him, it was a, you know, extremely important recording device. Meanwhile, his pictures go well beyond recording, because like the, the mushroom lady, for instance, is kind of transcendent in a lot of ways as a picture of a human being. Uh, but uh, uh, I don't think he really saw it that way at the time. Mm -hmm. I but see. Later did. He tried it with the camera. Good. But isn't it true that uh, what it's, it's very common that when new technologies appear, they're regarded as, um, you know, they're demeaned as mere mechanical without having any you know expressive qualities and then it takes a while for somebody to come along and bring out those expressive qualities yeah that's exactly what alfred stieglitz uh uh that was stieglitz's challenge and he worked and worked and worked he tried to get photography exhibited and people didn't want to exhibit it this is late 1890s now uh and opened his own gallery and published articles on and on and on, demonstrated with a camera on his own uh, how, uh, you know, this, this isn't just a mechanical device to record, uh, but, uh, but largely through his efforts at that period of time, things did change. And, uh, but you're right, it's, it's, there are probably parallels we can think of today. I don't know exactly what they might be, but I, I, I agree skepticism of new things. Joshua, yes, thank you. 
Actually, I was gonna say to Walter, but but the uh, yeah, I I was yeah I was thinking actually the the what you know when I was thinking about this about technologies, you know, we had the the flip phone always to the smartphone, and now we use it completely differently than what we used it before. But I also think about that with the camera in a way because the evolution. I mean, look how we go with these huge cameras all the way to the small Leica um, that can do so much that they couldn't do before, and I think. Uh, Alfred Stieglitz must have saw that and then knew, oh, I can do a lot more things with exposure. Um, I could put more light into the camera or less light in the camera. And, and notice that I, and I think when I'm looking at the, and I, I could be, you could disagree with me. I, I'm looking at Stieglitz's uh, photos. And I can see Bloch is attempting to try to do what Stieglitz is trying to do. So when you were telling that story about the, the developing, that makes so much sense because, um, when I'm looking at uh, Stieglitz's hands and what he's showing, there's a, a differences of like softness or it's it's not perfect. And it's per it's purposely not trying to be perfect. But then Block is trying to show it. It's like, oh, these are my my hands, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know what he's trying to do, but it's like there's like that special sauce that Stieglitz is trying to do, mm -hmm. and I, and uh, and I get to see that Block is trying over and over again to try to. Uh, um, find that special sauce because he knows that there is some art in this there is something less not just mechanical or just like okay they're purchased no there's actual meaning uh, but i do but i do say you know there was one that i had which was the uh um this when he was in santa fe with the pueblo woman that one definitely i really thought okay he got it <laughs> you know uh, just because of, of of how the light and, and it wasn't really perfect you know so mm -hmm. um well I would say about that is that you got to remember that Bloch did not print very many of his pictures. He did early on. Later on, they were printed uh, um, professionally with the Leica. He didn't. He developed the film himself sometimes, but or most of the time. But then sent them out uh, earlier on. Yeah, he did make look what they call what we call little contact prints, no enlargements, and for albums. Uh, so. He wasn't. He was able to make prints that is positives from negatives, and uh, but he was not. And he was a very good craft, but it wasn't taken. And that so much of what Stieglitz is doing is the interpretation of the negative onto a piece of paper, i.e., the print. That and is a material altered various methods. So that's that special sauce, and that's where the you know the craft and the professionalism comes. Uh, in addition to the release of the camera shutter, so and that's not territory that's, that that Block was able to explore. That's where you know obviously he was putting his efforts into the composing of music, uh, but so we, your reference there, uh, the the imperfections and this sort of thing, uh, part of that is simply that the you know I printed them as best as I could what you saw back in you know in the seventies and I did the best I could, but some of the negatives were damaged. And this sort of thing. So those pictures of the uh, Santa Fe or, or uh, the Taos, I think Taos Pueblo. Uh, and I remember those negatives. They're pretty not very good, actually. They're overexposed and this and that. And so there's some qualities of them that show up that appear to have analog analogy to some of Stieglitz's kind of soft quote focus and this sort of thing. And that's that's the reason. Uh, so you have to be careful, I think, to uh, recognize. I suppose uh, that. Somebody got in the middle of it and tried to do the best they could to get them visible to the world, and it turned out to me, me that, that me back in the '70s that did that. Uh, and so we got to be. All I'm saying is caution about uh, how much is block printing because he's not. The, those are the the act. The now the original little contact prints are all at the University of Arizona albums in black paper. And that would be something that uh, I really, now as I look back, why didn't you take pictures of those albums, Eric? <laughs> I was 22 years old, 23, 24 years old. I was not uh, really seeing the big picture. I was so enmeshed into it, enthusiastically enmeshed. So uh, I think that one of the things that really I ought to do or somebody ought to do is take a picture of some of those albums so people can see uh, what where the final resting place for most of his photography was or he'd send them in the mail like he'd send some to Ada Clement in San Francisco uh, you know because he wanted to share them so that's that's where that's what's going so I the process I need and a lot of people don't realize this the process 
that's gone on here is I got in the middle of it and kind of elevated the printing side, not perfectly, but you know, much more than he was able to do. So you can see what he, his vision, but the, the printing side was probably, have to be kind of put that in a perspective a little bit. That's a long answer, but it's important to be, re to be recognized. I think. Could I ask a question about uh, synesthesia? Because I found that part of your talk so interesting and I'm always so fascinated by this whole area of inquiry. And at the same time, I never, I never quite know what to think of it, honestly. Yes. Um, I understand that there are people who make this claim, like Kandinsky makes this claim to be able to see sounds. Um, but I'm never sure if this is some sort of ability that someone like Kandinsky has, which I lack. Um, in the same way that, let's say, if I were colorblind, I would lack the ability to distinguish uh, certain colors, or if it's to be understood in some different way as a poetic suggestion, as evocative language to describe, I don't know, how uh, hearing certain music just calls forth certain visual images, or seeing certain images, seeing clouds, uh, seeing uh, a tree calls forth uh, some kind of musical uh, parallel or, or something like that. Is there a genuine science of synesthesia or is that still kind of uncertain? Well, I, I can be, an, I'm not an expert on it, but I have done a little reading on it now, a little more since I was going to be uh, for this presentation. And it's, yeah, you can look it up. There are actually in, individuals that have a phenomenon of the brain where and often is dealing with numbers and letters oddly enough where they see colors in association with and this is a, not i wouldn't call it a condition but it's a perceptual phenomenon called synesthesia i don't know what the percentage of people that technically have this are uh it's very small i think but it's a recorded factual phenomenon in some individuals. At least that's my understanding. Mm. Somebody else might be able to add to that. I did a little that, bit of reading. And sorry, I think can, Kensky may very well uh, be one of those. Yes, Judy, yes. Yeah, can I just say that I remember seeing a program of quite a few years back about Messiaen, and he was talking about every, each, um, each key and each note had a different color for him. He had the synesthesia thing. And um, I think it's quite a well-recognized phenomenon. I don't know about uh, other composers, but definitely Messiaen was one of them. Mm -hmm. Scriabin uh, made a whole, a whole thing out of that. I mean, his, his Prometheus called for a, a color organ that would be projecting the colors that he experienced in his own music. He wanted that to be part of the experience. Right, although it was uh, never actually realized in the way he uh, envisioned it. A Alex. lot of his things weren't realized. Right, Alex, yes. You're muted, I think, Alex, we can't hear you. Is that better? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, I don't think that synesthesia is nearly as rare as it may seem to be. It's because people don't talk about it very much and I don't know why but they don't. Um, I know people, and including myself, people who have, for example, perfect pitch will not only be able to recognize the difference between keys in Western tonality, but they will also be able to identify certain colors with those particular keys. And I know that for myself, I do too. I also associate colors with certain days of the week. And now I don't know why. I mean, you know, it's not something, it's not an intellectual process. I don't work on it. It's just there. And I think that a lot of people have this actually. Now, whether it's been scientifically investigated or and to what extent and how rigorously, that I don't know. But I do think that it is something that is real for the people who feel it. Yes, yes. I'm uh, quite sure you're right. In fact, my own experience uh, confirms this. I also see colors when I think of certain letters, numbers, and days of the week. Uh, the problem is, if F sharp is purple to me, 
an orange to you, then what is it that we're actually dealing with? And I've uh, noticed that a number of uh, different uh, attempts to kind of chronicle what the actual correspondences are don't match up with each other at all. And that's what raises the, the question and a bit of confusion in my own mind about this. Yeah, I think the different colors um... Or, or rather different keys do have different colors for different people. It's not as though everybody thinks of A minor as orange. I see. Not everybody. I know I do. But I mean, you know, I can't then say, well, that is, you know, QED. Um, but nevertheless, I think that it's an interesting thing, not only to do with keys and color or sounds and colors, but also when I see certain colors of plants, flowers, certain kinds of colors will evoke um, all sorts of reactions in other senses, like, for example, taste. Hmm. I might be able to say that I can taste the color of a flower. I can't tell you what it tastes like, but I can tell you that I feel that is being stimulated. I see. That's all. Yeah. Now, I, you know, maybe I need to be investigated seriously because people might get worried about what's happening with Alex Knapp. I mean, you know, is he actually sane or, or, or does he have a big problem? But I don't think so because none of it is ever intrusive. It's just that it's interesting. And I think other people, as I say, um, have this. There are ramifications, which I don't think I need to go into now, but it's just, I feel that synesthesia is something that, <clears throat> that has been around for a long time, but I don't think that it is actually very much on the map when it comes to things, it being investigated uh, in a scientific way, say by university sort of students doing research. I don't, I don't think that's what's happening. Uh, and I'd be interested to know if there were uh, um, places, organizations, universities that actually did um, look into the whole question of synesthesia. The interesting thing is, of course, that when it comes to color, most of um, Bloss photographs were black and white. And mm. perhaps all of them were. And then you have the question of synesthesia applying to shades of black and white and of course, gray. Um, naturally. So what's happening there? And that just shows how subtle the whole, the whole matter is, because uh, black, white and grey may seem to be in some senses a limitation, but on other, in other senses it might actually be an intensification of the whole process of synesthesia. Interesting. Well, can I add something to that? I think that uh, I think synesthesia was used in a way as a part of this whole merging of the arts and whether people could feel it or see it, it's, it was a convenient uh, concept to bring arts, the arts together and kind of that Wagnerian uh, hope that Stieglitz was so enthusiastic about and, you know, O'Keefe uh, literally uh, painting music uh, there in 1919, uh, whether she could whether she was a synesthesia person or not, there was an attempt to use that, whether they even were using the word synesthesia. There's a linkage and an aspirational connection between photography in this case and music that was to a certain extent in the Stiglitz used it and with Bloch's response to elevate photography, to associate it with music. And a synesthesia is a nice link whether they could feel it or not. It was, it was an intellectual method to bring these things together to a certain extent. That would be one way to look at it. Uh, but meanwhile, Bloch saw the shades of gray as uh, oboes and other instruments. At least he says he did. Great. Yes, Alex, thank you. Can I just offer a thought about what you were saying about Bloch's, um, uh, what's the word? Um, can't think of the word now, unfortunately, this is happening sometimes. Um, he, he, when, when he was um, able to realize what Stieglitz was saying about the camera as a medium for art, uh, this was 
um, a kind of a moment of realization, something that he hadn't realized before. Um, and I'm just wondering whether that is actually the case. What I'm wondering is, because looking at uh, Bloss early pictures um, and looking at the later ones, the sort of like the pre-Stieglitz and the post-Stieglitz, um, I'm just wondering whether in fact Bloch was using the camera as a medium for art, even before he realized that's what he was doing. Um, as, a, as opposed to only using the camera as a medium for art after he'd had um, the uh, realization uh, of, you know, St of Stieglitz's input. Um, and I'm just wondering whether that might have been because before he resisted the idea of mechanization. And this was an intellectual process. He was against the idea that you can anything mechanical can be expressive. Um, and so therefore he didn't he didn't really almost want the camera to be a medium for art. But then when he realized what Stieglitz was doing, that he realized um, that ah, the word I wanted was epiphany. Mm. That was his moment when he realized actually that he had been wrong about that and that it can be used in that way. Um, mm. My my question then is, was it actually that he changed his mind or that he'd felt the same way all along and merely realized, became aware of what the camera could do um, and possibly felt it all along, but resisted it to begin with? Well, that's a great question, Alex, because uh, he was enthusiastic about the camera very early on. He was yeah. almost... Uh, he was very careful developing, printing, and he's sharing his pictures with friends, making albums. So, so he's very enthusiastic about it. And uh, but as he wrote, he had this 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 uh, structure, intellectual structure uh, for intuition, and you know, uh, intuition is uh, the, connected to the soul. Intellect is not connected to the soul. This sort of thing. So, and he wrote about it, as you see. So. It may very well be true. I mean, I it, what we're what I presented here may be a little too to pardon the, the pun. I'm a little too black and white. There's a gray. <laughs> There's a gray area, and uh, but there are some marks in time for sure in terms of response to Stieglitz. And I mean, you know, the whole moving to New York and you know, it must have been an extraordinary experience. I mean, those dinners with Stieglitz and all those people. Paul Rosenfeld, the music critic, is a big part of this, which I didn't have time to go into. Some of you know. Rosenfeld's work, uh, uh, so it it uh, is a gray area. I guess if we put as a photographer, I can say that. 